Can I welcome everyone to the 18th meeting of the Justice Committee in 2014? Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices completely as they interfere with the broadcasting system even when switched to silent? No apologies have been received. Item 1. I'm inviting the committee to agree to consider items 3 and 4 in private. Item 3 is consideration of a report by the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its work on the first year of police reform. And item 4 is initial consideration of our approach to budget scrutiny. Are you agreed to hear these items in private? Thank you. Item 2. This is day 1 of stage 2 proceedings on the Court Reform Scotland Bill. We can go up to and including section 60 of the Bill at this meeting and no further. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and his officials to the meeting. And you see that members should have their copies of the Bill, the marshal list and groupings of amendments for today's consideration. And I'm moving on straight away. I'll take it slowly to start with till you get into your stride. Now, that's not you, Cabinet Secretary. You're always at it. The question is that sections 1 to 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. <laughs> now I call Amendment 22 in the name of Liam MacArthur, grouped with Amendments 35, 36 and 37. I understand that Liam MacArthur is unable to attend today, but Alison McInnes will move and speak to these amendments. Alison, please, to move Amendment 22 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, I'm speaking to this group of amendments, as you say, in the absence of my colleague Liam MacArthur. He is sorry that he can't be here, <coughs> but is in Malawi this week with the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association as part of this Parliament's continuing links with the country. Um, my colleagues Lee MacArthur and Tavish Scott and myself are concerned about the impact that the proposal to abolish the position of honorary sheriffs will have upon local justice, particularly in their Northern Ireland um, constituencies, but also anywhere else where there is only one permanent sheriff. And I note that the committee report did um, touch on the concerns that they had round about this um, particular provision in the bill. Um, we think that honorary sheriffs are imperative to the delivery of justice in such rural and remote areas. Uh, they are afforded the same power and competence as a full sheriff. They are ready to lessen the impact of the absence of the resident sheriff and take decisions that are required as a matter of urgency, often out of office hours. However, the policy memorandum notes that there may never be enough work for a summary sheriff and sheriff, so there may never be a summary sheriff deployed in some remote areas. For places such as the islands, there is little certainty on where the nearest summary sheriff might be based. So this section, as it stands, could therefore further erode locally delivered justice. Amendments 22 and 35 would remove the provision abolishing honorary sheriffs. This is supported by the Law Society of Scotland, which believes there may well remain a need for honorary sheriffs in rural areas. Given they are unpaid, this would not have any financial implications. Alternatively, if the government is unable to support the removal of this clause completely, I would urge them at least to support amendments uh, 36 and 37, which would make the commencement of these provisions subject to the affirmative procedure, delaying the abolition of the Office of Honorary Sheriff until the Parliament is confident that robust alternative judicial arrangements are in place. And this would provide a safeguard against ministers simply asserting that the conditions for the abolition of honorary sheriffs, for example, appropriate technology, have been met. And I would urge members to support my amendment. You move. Um, Sorry, I move please. Amendment 22. Anyone else want to speak in this? No. Nope. Cabinet Secretary. Thanks. Amendments 22 and 35 in the name of Liam MacArthur, supported by Tavish Scott, would omit section 26, which abolishes the office of honorary sheriff and retain the ability of sheriff's principal to appoint honorary sheriffs. And amendments 36 and 37 also, as mentioned, seek to make the commencement of section 26 subject to affirmative procedure. The government recognises the contribution that honorary sheriffs have made to the justice system in rural, remote and island areas particularly in view of the fact that the position is unpaid, and I can readily appreciate the role which honorary sheriffs have played in Orkney and Shetland over the years. Honorary sheriffs perform urgent shrieval functions, such as a custody court in the absence or possible illness of the resident sheriff. At present, honorary sheriffs have the same powers and competence of a full sheriff, even although there is no necessity for them to be legally qualified. Many are former sheriffs or solicitors, but some are not. The policy of the bill is, however, to abolish the position of honorary sheriffs. The use of honorary sheriffs was criticised in some consultation responses and their abolition was supported by some stakeholders, including Scottish Women's Aid. It is considered that the need for honorary sheriffs will reduce and then disappear completely due to the advent of the new summary sheriffs and also as a result of the greater use of technology such as video links to remote locations. 
And I understand that some business in Stornoway is already being dealt with in Inverness uh, via video link. It's also desirable that Scotland should have a fully professional, legally qualified judiciary. And Lord Gill gave evidence uh, to that committee, and I quote, the honorary sheriffs have fulfilled a need, particularly in outlying courts, but in a modern judicial system, all judicial work should, wherever possible, be done by professionally qualified and properly trained sheriffs. And he went on to say, however, there's a value to be had from the services of honorary and outlying courts, and I imagine over time the need for those services will steadily diminish because with the increased flexibility that we'll have through the use of summary sheriffs and the ability to deploy summary sheriffs over a wide area and between courts, the need to bring in honorees at weekends, for example, would be much less. Abolition will be delayed until alternative judicial arrangements are put in place, and this may take some time as it's envisaged that summary sheriffs will be introduced gradually. It should, however, be possible to extend video links to a greater number of remote and rural courts more quickly. Amendments 36 and 37 would make the commencement of Section 26 subject to affirmative procedure in the Parliament. Commencement orders are not normally subject to any parliamentary procedure, and such a provision would be very unusual. I appreciate that the reasoning behind Amendments 36 and 37 is to give Parliament an opportunity to consider whether alternative judicial arrangements have been made and whether appropriate technology has been installed. The Government will work closely with SCS and the Lord President to ensure that we're content that the appropriate alternative arrangements are in place before the Office of Honorary Sheriff is abolished and Amendments 36 and 37 are unnecessary. And I would ask the Member to continue withdrawing these amendments, given the assurance that have been made that these are over some particular period of time and that alternative arrangements are also being ensured. Alison, to wind up, please. Uh, I hear what uh, the Minister says, um, and I do recognise the importance of uh, ensuring um, that uh, services across the whole of Scotland are, are of, a, of a piece, but I do think that it's important for this Parliament to have the assurances that we're seeking, and I will press the amendments. The question is, Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. There are no abstentions. That's three, four, six against. That amendment is not agreed. Um, I now move on to... Section the question is that sections 27 to 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I call Amendment 1 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary Group with Amendments 2, 3, 4, 20 and 19. Cabinet Secretary, please, to move Amendment 1 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Thank you. Amendments 1 and 2 in this grouping are technical amendments which respond to a point raised by the Dean of the Faculty of Advocates when he wrote to the Committee on 16th April in relation to the application of the exclusive competence limit by Section 39 of the Bill. The learned dean suggested that the present drafting leaves room for doubt as to whether the exclusive competence limit relates to the value of each individual order sought or whether it relates to the aggregate total value of such orders. Amendments 1 and 2 remove this doubt by providing that it's the aggregate total which applies. So if someone seeks two orders, one of which is for payment of 200,000 and another for payment of 6,000, the addition of the crave for 6,000 will not have the perverse effect of requiring an action which clearly has a value in excess of the exclusive competent limit must be brought in the share of court. Section 89 of the Bill permits remits of cases from the Court of Session to the Share of Court where the judge assesses that the value of the order sought is likely to be less than the exclusive competence of 150,000. It is therefore necessary to amend Section 89 to take into account the changes made to Section 39 by Amendments 1 and 2 in relation to how the value of an order or orders are assessed so that Section 89 operates under the same principles Amendment 19 and 20 uh, make the appropriate amendments. Amendment 3 is a technical amendment which is consequential on Amendments 19 and 20. Since these amendments introduced the term, in inverted commas, order of value, uh, close inverted commas, into Section 89, the definition of that term in Section 39, subsection 6, needs to apply also for the purposes of Section 89, and this is what Amendment 3 achieves. Amendment 4 
amends the existing power of the Court of Section and Subsection 7 of Section 39 to ensure that it has the power to make acts of sederunt governing the way in which the value of an order or the aggregate total value of orders is to be determined. And I move Amendment 1. Any other members wish to speak? Roddy Campbell. Uh, just briefly, uh, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's uh, proposed amendments. I think they deal well with the situation where there might be multiple financial claims, but where one of those claims is less than the exclusive competence limit. I'm pleased to support it. Really, Murray. Equally, I'd like to welcome the amendments and say that I'm also pleased to support them. I take it, Cabinet Secretary, you don't wish to wind up. No. Question is, Amendment 1 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 38, name of Roderick Campbell in a group in its own. Roddy, to move and speak to the amendment, please. Um, thank you, Convener. Can I just refer to my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates? Um, just moving on from the last amendments which we voted on, um, I still think there might be a problem in cases where the real purpose is something other than an order of value, such as a reduction contract or an interdict of a wrong, which is coupled with a claim for value, which is less than the financial limit. Um, one way around this, and to avoid um, the necessity to have kind of potentially multiple legal proceedings, it is uh, really why I have framed the amendment in the way I've done. But I'm more than happy to listen to the Cabinet Secretary's views on that point. You must move it first, please. Uh, can I move that amendment? Yes, thank you. Um, anyone else wish to come in at this stage? Elaine Murray. Uh, basically, um, I've got a lot of sympathy for the amendment. Um, again, I, like uh, Roddy Campbell, I'd be interested to hear what the Cabinet Secretary has to say and whether or not the, the previous amendments actually uh, under uh, take out the need for this amendment. But I think in, in, in the principle of the amendment, I, I certainly would uh, be very supportive of. Cabinet Secretary. Thank well, for Rod Gray raising this, and hopefully I can clarify for him and uh, Elaine Murray. Amendment 38 would have the effect that the exclusive competence of the Sheriff Court would only apply where the only order sought was an order of value. That is, an order for the payment of money or an order determining rights in relation to property. Section 39 gives the Sheriff exclusive competence in any civil proceedings in which an order of value is sought which does not exceed 150000 this is a consequence that in proceedings in which a number of orders are sought, for example, orders for reduction, interdict or declarator, as well as an order of value, then notwithstanding the nature and significance of the other order sought, if the order of value is less than 150,000, the case must be heard in the Sheriff Court. Roderick Campbell's amendment would mean that it would only be cases where only an order for value is claimed would be subject to the exclusive competence limit of the Sheriff Court. It's not difficult to imagine that parties may seek to avoid the effect of the new exclusive competence limit by simply adding an extra crave or request to the court in addition to the claim for an order for value. In this way, the 150,000 limit would be avoided. For example, if one had a claim for contractual damages of 25,000, the exclusive competence limit could be avoided by adding a claim for reduction of the contract. This would enable parties to frustrate the policy behind the exclusive competence. So Roderick Campbell's amendment would simply provide a way of avoiding the new exclusive competence, which I would remind committee members is intended to ensure that the resources of the courts are used efficiently. And I can understand where the member is coming from, but it is for that reason uh, that, as I say, I would ask him to withdraw his amendment. Okay. Secretary, to say I'm happy to withdraw my amendment. Uh, the member wishes to withdraw the amendment. Are you content? Thank you. The question is, but it's not. I call Amendment 2 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. A ready debate for Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is, Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 39 in the name of Roger Campbell. Group with Amendments 24, 40 and 23. And can I draw uh, committee members' attention to the preemption and direct alternatives? I point out that if Amendment 39 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 24, 40 and 23. They are preempted. I hope you take notes on this. Mm -hmm. And I point out that amendments 24, 40 and 23 are direct alternatives. Ro don't ask me to explain it again. Roderick Campbell first to move um, amendment. Could you just I'll do it again. No, well, just to clarify what that means, does that mean that if, if amendment 24 is passed, then the other two fall? If amendment 39 is agreed to, I can't I know, call I know, I know. 24, 40 and 23. What I'm interested in is... Because is, they are direct alternatives. Yeah, because if, say... Say 24 was agreed to. Excuse me, hang on a sec. <laughs> yes, 
These are, it's been explained right, to you, okay, and you get this right, wrong, okay. right? Okay. Start again. I should have had a bigger breakfast. We understand the preemptions. Amendments 2440 and 23 are direct alternatives, therefore, they can be called. Even though, when it's been, say, say 24 was passed, it would no longer be 150,000 in the bill. Yes. Yeah, and you can still call them. You can still call them. Oh. You can still right? Questions. I think you should. Would you like to sit here, making it a lot easier for me? <laughs> are we all happy now? Right? Um, I've lost my point sorry, now. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I'll go back to the beginning. Uh, Roderick Campbell, please, to move Amendment 39 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Um, thank you, Convener. Uh, first of all, can I just apologise to members of the committee who might be slightly confused by uh, my amendment. But if I can clarify, this amendment is not really about the limits uh, which we're about to discuss. It's really about the focus on whether um, commercial non-personal injury cases should be considered in exactly the same way as personal injury cases. I can refer to kind of the history of uh, court reform. In the Gill Review, as far as I can see, there was no real discussion about different privative limits for different types of claim. However, paragraphs 104, 105, 131 and 132 in Chapter 4 of the Review certainly dealt with statistics of business in the General Department of the Court of Session. Um, it's notable that paragraph 105 picked up that in the initial audit there were very few commercial cases, so a different audit was then uh, carried out. And the final statistics showed that 49% of, uh, uh, of commercial cases contained a conclusion for more than 150,000, and only 9% contained a conclusion for less than 50,000. So at the end of the day, we move on to the situation where approximately 26% of uh, actions, uh, commercial actions, would be transferred to the Sheriff Court in, in accordance with the draft bill's provisions. So the policy memorandum and the financial memorandum obviously take the Gill Review forward. It's noticeable that the financial memorandum has scenarios reflecting different scenarios for personal injury cases shifting from the Court of Session, but there is no scenario as to the impact on non-personal injury cases. So the information we really have is that about 700 cases would be transferred if the exclusive competence limit was kept at 150,000. We know to questioning from um, uh, myself to uh, Eric McQueen, the Scottish Court Service, that there is in fact no geographic breakdown as to where these transferred cases might come from. So in, in effect, we have very little information about the impact of these changes other than what's actually said in the Gill Review. I've no doubt that there are disproportionate costs incurred at, uh, in commercial cases as well as in personal injury cases, but at six figures, I would have thought that cases uh, where the disproportionate costs incurred are not particularly numerous in numbers. And I certainly believe that there are reasons why some of these cases end up in the commercial procedure in the court of session in the first place. I do feel that some of the arguments uh, we're hearing uh, have been are really uh, as a result of the necessity to fix the personal injury problem, if I put it that way. More importantly, although the bill provides for the possibility of a specialist national com commercial sheriff court, there are no plans in the short term to that degree to set up a national commercial sheriff, sheriff court. Indeed, also, if you then consider the argument that... Uh, that there is the possibility of specialist sheriffs uh, hearing matters locally. Lord Gill did in fact say on the 22nd of April that specialisation will be heavily concentrated in major courts in the cities. Uh, that's at paragraph 4530 on the 22nd of April. So whilst I accept also Sheriff Principal Taylor's argument that the evidence was that uh, commercial cases were, held, uh, were heard and dealt with properly in the Glasgow Sheriff Court, I don't think it quite deals with the point I made at the stage one debate about cases in Wick and Stranra. So whilst I accept what's been said about capacity in the evidence to the committee uh, and that these cases will no doubt uh, be uh, able to be heard at various courts throughout Scotland, I do have concerns as to whether, particularly in remoter areas, they're going to quite provide the access to justice for some people that might be provided in the cities. Uh, we're obviously going to hear a debate coming on on the appropriate uh, jurisdiction limit for personal injuries. I don't want to get too drawn on that for the moment. I'll listen carefully to what Sandra and the others have to say on that. Uh, but I would just invite the government to consider this position further and also to consider what further information might be provided on the impact of whatever limits are agreed before stage three. I, I move that amendment. Thank you. I take you don't want to speak on the other amendments in the group from Not what you've said. Yeah. Thank you. Sandra White, please, to speak to Amendment 24 and other amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Convener, and can I thank Roderick Campbell for his explanation on Amendment 39, 
He did start off by saying confused, but I think you have clarified for a number of us exactly what the amendment is, is looking to do or, or maybe probing uh, to do, uh, obviously regarding the personal injury and the sheriff court system as well, uh, regarding commercial injury courts. Uh, can I speak to amendment 40 and 23, uh, which Have is... Have you spoken to amendment 24 yet? Do you want me to speak well, that's to that first? That's your one. Yes, yeah, so I can speak to it after, though. I just wanted to... Up to you. Absolutely. I would prefer to go down that, that way, first of all. Th thank you very much, convener. Uh, Alison's and Elaine's amendments, uh, basically... I, I, I do think if too, too low a threshold for the limit is selected, for example, 30,000 and 50,000, uh, the reforms that we're looking at will not be delivered. Uh, the reduced cost and great efficiency, I don't think, uh, will be delivered also. And I also believe that the case for the new specialist uh, personal injury court, which is supported by the STUC, uh, would be undermined if we went down to such a lower figure. So that's uh, my comments on amendments uh, uh, 40 and 23. To speak to my own substantive amendment, uh, convener, uh, amendment 24 proposes an increase in the exclusive competence of the Sheriff Court to 100,000 rather than 150,000, which was suggested by Lord Gill uh, and the Scottish Government. Uh, I think we have heard uh, lots of evidence at this committee from stakeholders who have suggested that 150,000 is too high. Uh, we need to recognise that, I think, and that's why I propose to be lower the limit to £100,000. As I mentioned before in speaking to the other two amendments, uh, a limit of 50,000 or 30,000 will not deliver the changes uh, to vastly improve the civil court system. And I think we should remind members also that uh, the Scottish Government, which was under Labour at that particular time, Cathy Jimson, they asked Lord Gill and his team to, to do this and, and look at that. Uh, they were asked to produce an independent report to improve access to civil justice uh, by looking at reducing the cost of litigation and reducing delays. And, as I said, their advice was uh, to raise the exclusive competence to 150,000. I think the whole point is that the system has to be improved and should be improved for people who need to use it. A low limit, as been proposed earlier, is not going to do that. Too many cases will still continue to be raised in the Court of Session, and I think that will just clog up uh, that court. The Court of Session should be dealing with uh, complex cases, such as asbestosis cases, and we've heard about that at this committee also. And I think with this amendment, personal injury cases below 100,000 will get their own specialised personal injury court, or they could even be dealt with the uh, local sheriff courts by specialist sheriffs. And I think this is surely an improvement on the current system that we have, and we've give, would give stakeholders such as Clydeside Action more options to meet the needs of their members to settle their claims swiftly and, I think, effectively. And I move Amendment 24. We don't need to move it. Don't don't need to move it. Uh, Alison, please, to speak to Amendment 40 and the other amendments in the group. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, amendment 40 would decrease the proposed privative jurisdiction of the Sheriff Court to £50,000. Um, I think we're probably all agreed that the current £150,000 limit sets the bar far too high. It is a very significant leap from the existing £5,000 threshold and would be considerably higher than the equivalent limit elsewhere in the United Kingdom. My amendment to instead increase the privative jurisdiction of the Sheriff Court to £50,000 is supported by the Law Society of Scotland and it would bring Scotland broadly in line with England and Wales. I believe that this would go some way to allaying the concerns of many organisations regarding the automatic right to counsel, the impact on the bar and the possibility of attaining early and efficient settlement of cases. This bill is an opportunity for us to ensure that disputes are litigated at the most appropriate level, with low-value litigation predominantly removed from the Court of Session. The Committee has pre been presented today with a number of options on how best to achieve this, but in closing, I would, I would note that our deliberations on the appropriate limit have been hindered by the Scottish Government's inability to provide robust evidence in support of its proposal, something that has been widely criticised, and that would, of course, have been evidence that could have helped us in our consideration of these alternatives today. Thank you very much. Elaine Murray, please, to speak to me. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, the <coughs> can you wish. Excuse me. Uh, the Siege 1 report of the Justice Committee considered that the privative limit of 150,000 was too high. We heard it constitutes a 3,000% 3, increase in the current limit. It's five times the limit in Northern Ireland, three times that in England and Wales for personal injury claims and six times for other claims. The increase was criticised by the STUC, the EIS, the Scottish Police Federation, Clydeside Action on Asbestos, the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers, the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society of Scotland, to mention just a few. 
Uh, my amendment 23 is supported by the Faculty of Advocates and proposes a limit of 30,000, and I will go through how that has been arrived at. Uh, the argument is that the, the figure of 150,000 was based on a weak analysis in the Gill report of old and limited data, data 93 cases over a three-year period representing less than 1% of cases. The Faculty of Advocates and the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers have conducted two separate and more robust analyses of, of a total of 1,001 cases over 2011 and 2012, and these figures were provided for me by the gentleman whom uh, the Cabinet Secretary referred to as the Learned Dean, so hopefully you would have some confidence in the figures he's provided to me. Uh, this demonstrates that a much lower limit would achieve the aims of the Gill Review. Indeed, 70% of all personal injury cases settle for 20,000 or less, and 80% for less than 50,000. The two analyses suggest that a limit of 100,000 would leave only 13% of personal injuries with the Court of Session, if the intention is to retain 20, 000, uh, 20 of cases in the court of session, the privative limit needs to be between 30,000 and 50,000. 30,000 is a compromise which would bring Scotland into line with Northern Ireland. Although the Gill Review considered cases worth 150,000 to be quote of low value, this sum is more than the, uh, the sum is more than the of 30,000 is more than the average annual wage. And the limit of 30,000 would allow people resident in Scotland with serious, life-limiting injuries to access a court of session and to have the benefit of advice by counsel. It will help to ensure equality of arms in more serious cases, as most insurance companies will be in a position to afford to instruct counsel, and the proposal will not incur costs, costs to the public purse, as most personal injury cases are pursued on a no-win-no-fee basis. Now, I asked representatives from organisations arguing for a lower limit for examples of cases where the proposals in the bill would have disadvantaged clients and I'll briefly run through some of these examples by way of illustration as to why victims need these limits to be substantially reduced. And we're not talking about victims of crime here, but we are talking about victims of injustice, injustices such as industrial injury uh, or accident at work. In May this year, a mother claimed for the loss of her 19-year-old son. She was uh, awarded £86,000 by the Court of Session. And comparison with similar cases in the Sheriff Court suggests that if the case had been taken there, the award would have been around half of that sum. Last month also, a schoolgirl injured when a bus she was travelling in was blown over was awarded £30,000 by a jury in the court of session against a bus company. This again was a complex case which was won for her by an experienced advocate. Three cases brought to the court of session in 2010 against the MOD by parents who had lost sons who were servicemen in the Nimrod crash in 2006 resulted in awards of between £90,000 and £100,000. The parents would, in all likelihood, have con received considerably less in the sheriff court, possibly as little as £15,000 or £25,000. A woodworker who contracted nasopharyngeal cancer due to wood dust exposure in what was an extremely unusual case lost several years' pay, and he was awarded uh, less than 150,000 by the Court of Session. But if he had not had specialist representation in the Court of Session for what was a very rare case of a catastrophic injury, he probably would not have received anything at all. So the privative limit, in my view, must be substantially lowered for a number of reasons. The calculation of, on which 150,000 is based have been proved by analysis of data from two independent sources to be incorrect. The number of cases likely to be retained by the Court of Session will be too low to maintain experience in that court or to provide an adequate opportunity for the training of young advocates. The high privative limit would also have consequences for commercial cases, and I share some of Rod Roddy Campbell's uh, concerns about this, because the Bill does not propose a specialist commercial sheriff court. Businesses would be therefore offered the choice between having cases arise at value less than 150,000 heard by sheriff, who in many parts of the country, as Mr Campbell has said, may not be a specialist com commercial sheriff, or writing into their contracts that any disputes will be heard under English law, where uh, cases above 25,000 can be heard in the High Court. There's also the very important issue of equal access to justice. Most people earn well under £30,000, and significant levels of personal injury could result in claims for much less than the privative limit. But rather than just being low-value cases, they may still involve catastrophic injury with life-changing consequences. They may also be complex and require specialist representation. The bill, as it stands, risks creating greater inequality, and the privative limit must be substantially re reduced, in my view. Now, I'm proposing a limit of 30,000, but if it, in the, the, the discussion it appears that the committee would prefer the limit that Alice McInnes is, is proposing 50,000, I would be pre prepared to support that, uh, it, with, with the, so long as we can actually reduce this limit, because I seriously believe that it, it must be re reduced. I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the views of committee members in terms of whether or not I press my amendment or we go for Alison's. Uh, John Finney, then um, Margaret Mitchell. John? 
Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I think there's sometimes a, a, a difficulty looking at one section in splendid isolation, and I have to say uh, my intention is to support um, Sandra's amendment, uh, and that's not a position I would necessarily have thought I would have found myself in at the outset. I, I've sought to understand the wider implications of this, and the percentage shift of workload, I think, is important if the whole process is to work. It is part of the wider package. I don't recognise some of the stuff that Elaine says in relation to, to low value. I certainly wouldn't be party to anything I thought would disadvantage any victim, be it a victim of uh, whose issues would be dealt with by the criminal court or the civil court. And I think there are aspects of reassurance that people would quite understandably seek regarding representation that can and that hopefully are going to be dealt with elsewhere. Um, so I, I am reassured that um, we can get everything um, that I, I think... Um, many people would seek. And, and I'm, if I say that, I'm always minded to, to follow uh, the STUC's position in that. And this isn't an issue that they are, they are um, now concerned with. They are relaxed with the, the proposal that's been suggested with Sandra. So that's a position I'll be adopting. Margaret. Yeah. I think we all agree with that. The 150,000 uh, limit really is too high. Um, the question is, where do we um, base the threshold? I'm not persuaded by the 100,000. Again, there's a real lack of any empirical evidence to support why it should be 100,000, nor am I persuaded by the argument that personally injured cases and people like Clyde Asbestos Action would be um, really pleased with a 100,000 threshold rather than having the opportunity to take their um, case to the court of session, where, of course, counsel is is guaranteed and there is an equality of arms and representation. Um, I'm attracted by uh, Alison's proposal of 50, which I think is a consequence, though I have to say if that fails, I would most certainly for, um, support Aileen's for, for 30,000. And I am very concerned about some of the cases and the evidence that she's brought to committee today. And there is an, an argument here, I think, uh, convener, for taking more evidence on this very, very important issue which affects access to, to justice. So um, I'm, I'm happy to support Alison's 50, which would give parity with England and Wales and avoid any unintended consequences of the different levels there. Uh, that failing, then I certainly would support Elaine Murray's amendment. Um, yeah, I'll take, uh, I'm going to take Christian first, and myself, and then I'll have you with your point, point of information. Yes, Christian. Thank you, Convener. I, I just would like to make my point clear uh, after uh, the debate and after the, the committee at stage one that uh, um, I'm not the only one thinking that 150,000 uh, is a uh, is, uh, right way to have this limit at. Uh, other examples like organizations like which and Citizens Advice Bureau did say they uh, very, very relaxed 150,000. Not only this, but they thought that 150,000 what was the best way uh, to address uh, this court uh, reform, particularly if cases coming before the new pers personal injury court are limited. The specialism of the court will be undermined, say Lauren Wood of, of CAS, uh, Gilla Clark of which uh, did say that it was about proportionality in the system which is what consumers require when it comes to access to justice. And Lord Gill and so uh, uh, Sheriff Principal Teller uh, made it very, very clear that 150,000 is, is what they thought was the best way uh, to, uh, to, to address that, that, uh, that change in, 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 in the course reform and making sure that all reforms are working and are working uh, properly. I, I'm, I'm quite disappointed. Uh, that, uh, that a lot of the members are thinking that 30 or 50,000 pounds uh, will not uh, um, uh, cause a lot of damage to the, to the spirit of the, of the bill. Uh, but uh, I will uh, talk down to 200,000 pounds. I think uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, and I will encourage every member uh, to, 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 um, to back the 100,000 pounds that Sandra White, the amendment that Sandra White I brought forward, uh, even if I would have preferred uh, it to, to stay at 150,000. And regarding Ellen Murray, 
uh, examples, a kind of thing, and we heard that during the evidence, but most of these exa examples anyway uh, will go to the court of session because we have very complex cases, like, like Ellen Murray said, and complex, uh, complex cases, whatever uh, the, 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 the value of them attached to them, uh, will have to go to the court of session and will go to the court of session, and I'm quite reassured by, 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 by that. Uh, yes, I have to say I didn't quite, um, I think it's important, John Finney, what you said about later sections that are coming up, because we have to embrace it all together, and that we will, as, as, you, as you have said, Christian, uh, there will still be a remit at the court of session on what kind of test the committee feels should be applied there, whether it's the bill as, as lodged or uh, with amendments, and similarly with availability of counsel. I think that's an issue. This is perhaps a problem at stage two, that we'll, we'll see how these mesh together uh, uh, after stage two. Um, I would say to Elaine Murray, I don't know how she got the figures, the contrast between the share of court awards and the court of session awards, um, because unless a case is actually tested at a proof, um, how can you have such a disparity? Now, I, I, I'm happy to hear if there's some academic research or you know where these differences came, because you make quite substantial claims of huge differences in an award at the court of session to an award at the share of court. And I I didn't know where that had come from. They were provided to me from a QC. Uh, they may have been provided by a QC, but what was the, the evidential basis for it? You know, I mean, we have to look at... Um, the only thing that tells you at the end of the day what a court will award is what a court awards. Uh, and in my view, any court looking at the... Um, even a sheriff on, sitting on his or her own will look at previous cases and looks at the awards, they would not be so far out, because if they were so far out, there would be an appeal to the share of principle. And so that kind of, I just wondered about that. Um, that's just my comment by way of that. So I think the difficulty is, I, I'm sympathetic to 100,000 currently, when we see how the rest of the bill uh, it pans out at the other sections with availability of counsel, remit to the court of session, those tests which are very important to make sure that complex cases do not remain in the sheriff court but are in an, an easy way put forward to the court of session and where QCs will be available and testing specific and perhaps novel areas of law or even of difficulties in evidence. Roddy, you had a point of information. Just uh, picking up on what my colleague Margaret Mitchell said about the position in England, 50,000 limit. Uh, technically, I think the position in relation to non-personal injury cases, money cases in England, was changed by statutory instrument on the 22nd of April, and the limit in England for non-personal injury cases is now 100,000. About the other cases? It remains at 50,000. Thank yeah. you. And that's it. So that, thank <coughs> you for the point of information. And I'll now ask the Cabinet Secretary for your comments, please. Well, thank you. And I was grateful to Rod Campbell for that uh, point of information. The discussions the Lord President had uh, indicated that to me. With regard to his amendment, I think it's clear to us that there is a desire, and it was mentioned in the Civil Courts Review, to see whether uh, specialisation can take place. Aberdeen is getting a new commercial and civil centre. The bill allows the Lord President uh, to designate categories of specialism, so that opportunity is there. Uh, that's why I I'm happy to say that I think the Lord President and the Civil Justice Council will reflect upon that, but I do think that his uh, current amendment uh, would ensure that personal injury cases of 150,000 or less may only be raised in the Sheriff Court, but in other cases the limit would be 100,000. This would have the effect of setting the bar higher for personal injury cases and other cases to be able to raise in the court of session. So I don't support this amendment, although it could be said that the amendment goes to the grain of our policy to return low-value personal injury cases to the share of court, including sending many cases to the new specialist personal injury court. We said in our stage one response that we do not consider it appropriate to introduce different exclusive competence limits for different types of cases, uh, but specialisation will be for the SCJC. Figures from the Scottish Court Service in 2011-12 show, for example, that there were only 146 commercial cases in the Court of Session. So given that relatively few cases would be affected, we don't think there's a case for different limits. Sheriff Principal Taylor said in 22nd April in his evidence uh, that many actions for considerably more than 150,000 are raised in the commercial court in uh, Glasgow Sheriff Court. Amendment 24, in the name of Sandra White, will ensure that cases of 100,000 or above may only be raised in the Court of Session. This would have the effect of lowering the exclusive competence limit on the face of the bill 
from 150,000 to 100,000. As the Minister said when she gave evidence to the Committee on 29th April, we were listening to stakeholders on this issue. And while the Committee has heard from organisations such as which who support 150,000 limit, many of those who appeared in front of the Committee thought that 150,000 was too high a figure for the exclusive competence. And this point was highlighted to a lesser degree during the consultation in the Bill. We have had recent discussions with the STUC who also voiced concerns about the appropriate level of the limit. Taking all of this on board, I think this amendment strikes a balance between the original exclusive competence figure of 150,000 suggested by Lord Gill and the views of certain stakeholders, while still being able to deliver the more efficient and affordable system intended by the Scottish Civil Courts Review, and I'm happy to support this amendment. Amendment 40, in the name of Alison McInnes, will ensure that cases of 50,000 or above may only be raised in the Court of Session, and Amendment 23, in the name of Elaine Murray, ensures that cases of 30,000 or above may only be raised. Uh, I don't support either of them. I don't accept, uh, as I think you, convener, were alluding to, that cases would be uh, given a lower award in the Sheriff Court. I don't think there's any evidence of that, and certainly in any event there is a specialist personal injury court, I think, that would ensure that balance. Equally, I think it's also important to point out that the whole purpose of Lord Gill's review was to ensure access to justice, which he indicated was not being provided. But I think you've put in appropriate caveats about further amendments to come on remit and sanction. So I would remind the committee that uh, both Labour and the Conservatives signed up to the principle uh, in the SCCR of delivering a justice system with fewer delays and costs, which is what I believe has been delivered uh, by uh, the uh, Lord uh, President. Some stakeholders, such as the Faculty of Advocates, Association of Personal Injury Lawyers and the Law Society, have asked that there be a lower exclusive competence with the faculty referring to limits in place in other UK jurisdictions. Uh, this doesn't compare like with like, and indeed uh, Rod Campbell has helpfully pointed out the recent changes in personal injury matters south the border. One of the major issues that the Scottish Civil Courts Review pinpointed was that the sum sued for in claims is being inflated by around three times in order to bring claims in the Court of Session. This means that it's highly misleading for APIL and others to quote the settlement figure in the context of setting an appropriate exclusive competence figure. In the current circumstances, applying the finding of the SCCR, a settlement figure of 30,000 or 50,000 could likely be the result of a claim being brought for 90,000 or 150,000. To put it another way, if we reduce the exclusive competence to 50,000, the likely settlement figure would only be around £17,000 in terms of the money awarded at the end of the case. We need to choose the level of the exclusive competence based on the sum sued for, as that is what is used to decide in which court to raise the claim. If people's cases are heard in the right courts, in a more efficient civil justice system, it will allow them to reach settlement and get their awards more swiftly. Lord Gill's aim in proposing the reforms is to make justice more accessible to more people and lower the cost of getting justice, not to disadvantage people. An exclusive competence as low as 50,000 or even 30,000 will fundamentally fail to achieve this. So I would urge the committee to reject amendments 39, 40 and 43, and I'm happy to support Amendment 29 in Sandra White's name. Roderick Campbell to wind up, please. Uh, just to get clarify for the record, what I was saying about the change in England is it's non-personal injury cases, the limit is 100,000. Personal injury cases remain at 50,000. Um, but uh, I'm not going to press my amendment, convener. Well, you're not. You're with, seeking withdraw to withdraw it. Seeking to withdraw it. Is yeah. that agreed? Agreed. Right. Uh, I think, Cabinet um, Secretary, you intended to say Sandra White's amendment was Amendment 24. Sorry. Yeah, no. Unless you've changed your tune during no, the. No. Right. Okay. Um, I call Amendment 24 in the name of Sandra White. Already made Amendment 39 to move or not move. Uh, move, convener. The question is: Amendment 24 will be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. <laughs> oops, that could have been a real oops moment. Those against, please show. The 544 four against that amendment is agreed. Call Amendment 40 in the name of Alison McInnes. Already made an Amendment 39. Alison, to move or not move? Oh, move. The question is Amendment 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. No. Uh, there will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. 
four, four, five against. That amendment is not agreed. I call amendment 23 in the name of Elaine Murray. Already waived amendment 39 to move or not move. Moved. The question is that amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There is not an agreement. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Four, four, five against. No abstentions. That amendment is not agreed. I now call Amendment 25 in the name of John Pentland and a group in its own. John, please, to move and speak to that amendment. Thank you, Convener. Uh, the Scottish Parliament has always accepted that asbestos related conditions are something of an exceptional circumstance when it comes to legislation and the pursuit of cases through the courts. That was clear in 2011 when the damages asbestos related conditions Scotland Bill was agreed. And I also note that asbestos is singled out in Stuart McMullen's mooted private members' bill's recovery of medical costs for asbestos diseases. Now, in their evidence, the Clydeside Clyde Action on Asbestos argued that their members' cases must fall into the definition of the most complex and important cases, needing access to experienced advocates and solicitor advocates who have knowledge of the specialised area of law and swift access to the to justice at the highest level. They also pointed out that 95% of these cases, the value of damages is lower than £150,000, but that the complexity is shown by the proportion that have been appealed to the Supreme Court. Sheriff Principal Taylor argued that many would end up in the Court of Session anyway because of their complexity, but of course the process would be more drawn out. So prompt consideration of asbestos cases is important, and my amendments seek to recognise that and the complexity, and by excluding such cases from the changes proposed in the Bill, I move the amendment. Thank you very much, John. Anyone else wish to speak on this? Yes, Margaret, thank I, you. I have some sympathy with uh, John uh, Pentland's amendment. The difficulty, of course, is always in the detail by legislating for one particular group, then it's, it makes it unclear who else would fall into this category. Yes, I think I myself would support Margaret and that. I'm huge, huge sympathy for it. But again, if you take one group and say you're special, then another group should come along and say we're also special. And again, we still have the option within the Sheriff Court Park, being a specialist Sheriff Court, an option with complexity for remits uh, to the Court of Session. And then when there's decisions at the Supreme Court, of course, these are valuable in determining what are complexities and what value should be placed on matters. Uh, so on that basis, really on the basis of principle that um, to make one group worthy, very worthy, though they are special against any other group that is now or may come along, presents difficulties, I think, if you legislate in that way. Does so anyone else wish to say, John Fin... Oh, sorry, Elaine. Um, I think uh, the way in which the discussion is divided up uh, it goes back to the problem to which John Finney referred, because there may be other amendments which come later which would clarify some of the issues around making a special case out of one, because there are amendments which would enable you by or enable ministers to alter um, the special, or what comes in as a special case. So, you know, I think that that's part of the, the problem is we're only looking at this one amendment today, and there are other, are other amendments which are likely to come up next week, which would actually make which would um, overcome some of the difficulty to which the convener refers. And there are options at stage three in that case. John, do you want to come in? John Finney? <clears throat> Thank you, convener. Y yourself and Elaine have largely covered it. I wouldn't want uh, opposition to this to be seen as not being sympathetic or recognition of the, the, the complexity of uh, the asbestos cases. And it's for that reason I think they will be picked up later on in, in the legislation. <clears throat> and, and like others, I'm sympathetic to this, but I, I do find it difficult to just single out one particular type of claim. Obviously, clinical negligence, for example, raises other issues. Uh, so I, th I, th I think, uh, on balance, I think we should oppose this amendment. Cabinet Secretary. Well, yes, I think the government, uh, like other members who have spoken, uh, sees where John Pentland has come from, and, and we all have a great sympathy there. That's why we've taken action to assist all of those harmed by an excellent negligent exposure to asbestos. We've legislated to ensure that a person dying from mesothelioma can achieve damages without preventing members of the family making a future claim for damages. And we've also supported legislation that clarifies Scots law as it relates to damages for fatal personal injuries, reducing requirements for potentially intrusive, protracted and costly investigations and making the settlement of claims quicker and fairer. 
The Courts Reform Scotland Bill will ensure that cases are heard in the appropriate court, reducing unnecessary delays and disproportionate costs to all litigants. This is an important and sensitive area, and I have listened carefully to the evidence given to the Committee at Stage 1 on the subject, and particularly what was said by Phyllis Craig of Clydeside Action and Asbestos and Sheriff Principal Taylor, and I have also met with Phyllis Craig of Clydeside Action. Amendment 25 seeks to keep all asbestos cases in the Court of Session. In her evidence to the Committee, Ms Craig said I would prefer them to be heard in the Court of Session. However, if they had to be moved, we would want them to be moved into the Sheriff Court with all solicitors and advocates' fees paid and with the procedures that ensure efficiency in the Court of Session transferred to the Sheriff Court. And let me address some of these points. On the question of whether all asbestos-related disease cases should automatically be raised in the Court of Session, I actually agree with Sheriff Principal Taylor. He argued that a decision to grant sanction for counsel should be dependent on the merits of each case. He went on to say, though, and I quote, a complex asbestosis case will probably be remitted to the Court of Session. However, even if it were to remain in the Sheriff Court, it would almost certainly merit sanction for counsel. That's certainly not just my experience as a government minister, but my experience as a practising lawyer. So whilst there will not be automatic sanction for counsel in the Specialist Personal Injury Court or the Sheriff Courts, the government believes that all cases that merit counsel will continue to benefit from the expertise of counsel. Most asbestos-related disease cases, even those of a relatively low financial value, fall into this category. And where these cases are heard in the Sheriff Courts or the Specialist Personal Injury Court, the Sheriff, who will have all the facts before him or her, is best placed to decide whether sanction for counsel is appropriate. That takes us into, and doubtless be discussion next week, as you alluded to, convener, in terms of the equality of arms, a position that has been put forward by Sheriff Principal Taylor, which I agree and have great sympathy for. In addition, complex cases, which I understand are the majority, will be able to be remitted to the Court of Session, where the Sheriff in the Court of Session agrees that it is the most appropriate course of action. And to add further comfort, we'll be bringing an amendment next week to ease the test for remit from the Sheriff Court to the Court of Session, which I think is some of the changes referred to by John Finney and others relating to the STUC. So I meet regularly with Clydeside Action and Asbestos, and I will continue to do so through the passage of this bill. The aim of these meetings is to ensure that all those who suffer from all and all those who have lost loved ones on account of this distressing disease are supported throughout the court process and receive the justice that they deserve. I think that is shared by the committee, but I can give the committee an assurance that we think there will be the appropriate options in terms of remit, in terms of sanction, in terms of quality of arms to ensure that the requirement for asbestos is met with and indeed, as I say, the complexities about what other uh, categories of victims uh, would also have to be considered. So in these circumstances, sharing the committee's, uh, as I say, uh, sympathy for asbestos, I think we can provide a solution through other changes <coughs> and in the bill, and uh, therefore I oppose Amendment 25. It's not possible for your Cabinet Secretary to tell us that how you're going to ease the test, uh, because I don't know if the amendment's lodged, but it would be helpful... Um, but perhaps not. Don't want to put you on the spot. But to do so at the moment, what I can say, I'm discussing matters with the STUC, and indeed I will be keeping uh, Phyllis Craig appraised. But we have already had discussions on. Is it that particular? Is that the one that we signed off? No, I'm not sure. No, no. no. Yeah. Well, our amendments will be lodged at noon today, so they are okay. happening at the... So you could tell uh, us it? Uh, uh, well, I don't have it in front oh, of Oh, right, unfortunately, right, uh, so we... But it would be fair to say that the amendment has been run by many of the organisations that we've read to, uh, and, as I say, there, there are further ongoing discussions. Because you do appreciate that the committee had concerns oh, yes. about the test, as, as was in the bill lodged. Um, John Pentland, please, to wind up. Hey, convener, in light of what has been said, I'll withdraw the amendment just now. Uh, John seeks leave to withdraw this. You agreed? Thank you very much. I call Amendment 3 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already raised Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. call Amendment 4 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already raised Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Amendment Moved. 4. Sorry. Thank you. The question is Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. The question is that Section 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that sections 40 to 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you very much. I call Amendment 41 in the name of Alison McInnes, Group with Amendment 42. Alison, please, to move Amendment 41 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Convener. Amendments 41 and 42 would remove adoption and force marriage proceedings from the list of civil proceedings in which a summary sheriff has competence, as set out in Schedule 1. 
Supported by the Law Society of Scotland and the Faculty of Advocates, these amendments reflect the fact that adoption and forced marriage proceedings can be particularly complex. Um, following a parliamentary approval of an LCM earlier this year, it will shortly become a criminal offence to force someone into marriage and it will be punishable by up to seven years in prison. And we ourselves struggled with the interaction between the civil remedy and, and the criminal um, proceedings that we'll, we'll pursue. In the context of this new criminal liability, the existing civil remedies for those at risk of forced marriage and those who have already in, entered into a forced marriage, forced marriage protection orders will become even more sensitive. The international, racial and ethical dimensions of such cases can also cause them to be extremely complicated. Similarly, the Law Society of Scotland argues that adoption and the grant of authority to adopt are the most serious form of interference in family life and as such should not be the responsibility of the most junior tier of the judiciary. The Society argues that these are amongst the most demanding cases heard in the Sheriff Court. In seeking to establish the facts, they can consider a wealth of reports and records and hear from a number of witnesses. And it can be a difficult balancing act to satisfy the requirements of both domestic and international law, primarily the European Convention on Human Rights. The Society, therefore, maintains that these cases should continue to be heard by specialist family sheriffs who are best placed to respond to the complexity of these cases and consider their far-reaching consequences. Um, to put it into perspective, these cases strike me as requiring a greater level of shrieval competence than, for example, the consideration of warrants and interim orders and extensions of time to pay debts. And I move Amendment 41. Sorry. Yes, Margaret Mitchell. I think Alison um, McInnes makes a compelling case. These are very complex cases. Um, very um, emotive cases too uh, and I think it does make sense to remove them from the competence of the summary sheriff's jurisdiction. I, I'm back to where I was I think, well, I beg your pardon Elaine, and then I'll come in. Sorry, I'll right. you usurp you because you were so good to me early on when I hadn't found my feet. Right. <laughs> I, I too am very sympathetic to both his amendment and Alison McInnes's name. The only thing I would say in, in passing, actually, is I think a case could be made that some domestic abuse proceedings would not be appropriate to be dealt with by simple procedure either. So I don't know whether we, we need to return to something uh -huh. like that. I, I, I'm back to blanket removal uh, because I think we were hearing the evidence the sheriff principal would be looking at the allocation of cases uh, to sheriffs. So, um, uh, you know, as we go through this process over the, of the coming years, the sheriff principal will be looking at whether or not it would be appropriate to be a summary sheriff. So I'm always very cautious about taking something completely out of the remit. Uh, I mean, I, take, I hear your argument. They are complex. Some might have to be remitted to the court of session if there's special case. Else. I think flexibility uh, within um, which sheriff hears something, which court hears something is always terribly important. Anyone else? No, Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Convener. I think the, the initial point I make is some of these sheriffs are going to be highly qualified, at least 10 years uh, professional standing. And as you were alluding to, assignment of businesses for the sheriff principal, and indeed particularly complex uh, cases, the sheriff may choose to assign it to a, a sheriff as opposed to a summary sheriff because jurisdiction is concurrent. But amendments 41 and 42 in the name of Alison McInnes would remove adoption proceedings and forced marriage protection orders from the competence of summary sheriffs. The rationale for the introduction of summary sheriffs as they should undertake work in the sheriff court to relieve sheriffs of the burden of dealing with the more legally straightforward civil cases and to thus permit sheriffs to be available for more complex casework. The review suggested that the advent of summary sheriffs will help to promote the development of specialisation at both shrieval and summary sheriff level while maintaining where practicable the balance the principle of access to local justice. These reforms are about a proportionate use of the judiciary in line with the complexity and are by no means about devaluing the importance of specific cases. We recognise that all cases are important to resolve for those involved. And although the intention is that cases should be dealt with at an appropriate level in the court hierarchy, which means that some cases will be heard by summary sheriffs, this does not mean that the quality of justice will be lowered. All judicial officers at whichever level of the court system will be recommended for appointment by the Judicial Appointments Board of Scotland and trained as required by the Judicial Institute of Scotland. Shera, summary sheriffs will be drawn from the ranks of practitioners who have been legally qualified for at least 10 years, the same as sheriffs, and have experience of the kinds of cases which will fall within their competence. And I would also point out that there will be some considerable time before summary sheriffs are deployed widely following recruitment and training. And in rural areas, there may not be enough work for both a summary sheriff and a sheriff, so there may never be a summary sheriff deployed in some remote areas. 
all of the cases will remain with the resident sheriff in those areas. It's for those reasons that the policy is that summary sheriffs should have concurrent civil competence with sheriffs. Giving evidence at the Justice Committee on 18th March, the Sheriffs Association said that they welcomed the jurisdiction of the summary sheriffs and that the summary sheriffs will be, and I quote, perfectly competent and also, quote, comfortable doing family cases, drawing summary sheriffs from areas of specialist expertise and bringing practical experience is seen as a good opportunity by some solicitors, including experienced family practitioners. The role also creates an excellent opportunity for the diversification of the Scottish judiciary. When asked whether she would prefer a summary sheriff or sheriff to deal with family law cases, Karen Gibbon of the Family Law Association told the committee that, and I quote, in fact, it does not really matter whether they're summary sheriffs or sheriffs, as long as they're experienced and have knowledge of family cases, that is the most important thing, end quote. Following consultation, concurrent jurisdiction between sheriffs and summary sheriffs was extended to adoption and permanence cases and all relevant provisions within the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011 relating to court procedures arising from the children's hearing system. This decision has been taken to address concerns that unless summary sheriffs were given full concurrent competence in these areas with sheriffs, it would mean that although some procedures might be dealt with by a summary sheriff, some closely related procedures could still have to be heard before a sheriff, leading to confusion among court users and inevitably greater expense to litigants and to the court system through duplication of proceedings. By giving a wider concurrent competence, it will be possible for the whole of a case to be heard by either a summary sheriff or a sheriff, and the possibility that some parts of proceedings are heard before a summary sheriff and some before a sheriff will be avoided. The Lord President suggested that forced marriage protection orders should be included in the competence of the summary sheriff. Amendments 41 and 42 do not divide cases up along lines of importance. They would, for example, leave domestic abuse proceedings, children's hearings within the competency of the summary sheriff, neither of which I would respectfully suggest the committee are less important than the adoption or forced marriage. The government believes that these amendments would lead to incoherence in the summary sheriff's jurisdiction. And for that reason, I would ask the member to withdraw her amendments. Uh, can I, Alison, to wind up, please? Well, I'm, I'm a little confused because I think when the Cabinet Secretary opened his remarks, he um, almost made the case for me. Um, this, he said that the summary sheriffs should be dealing with the more straightforward cases. Um, I was not suggesting that these were more important cases um, than, than, than domestic abuse or, or, or other child protection. I was saying that they were most likely more complex. Um, they are, without a doubt, not straightforward cases, and I will press my amendment. Question is Amendment 41. We agree to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. That amendment 44 against 5. That amendment is disagreed. Call Amendment 42 in the name of Alison McInnes, already debated with Amendment 41. Alison, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. The question is at Schedule 1. We agree to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Question is at Sections 44 and 45. We agree to. Are we all agreed? I don't know if you're still here. Yes, you are. Right, OK. Um, now I move on to call Amendment 5 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary Group with Amendments 29, 9, 10, 30, 11, 12, 15 to 18, 21 and 34. And I do understand this bit. Uh, to tell you the pre point of Amendment 30 is agreed to, I can't call Amendment 11, it's preempted. Right? Cabinet Secretary, please to remove Amendment 5 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Uh, let me begin by addressing Elaine Murray's amendments. The purpose of Amendment 29 uh, is to ensure that an appeal in the Sheriff Appeal Court is heard by a bench consisting of three or more appeal sheriffs. In addition, at least one of those appeal sheriffs on the bench must be a sheriff principal, and at least one must be considered by the President uh, of the Sheriff Appeal Court to be a specialist in the type of case to be heard. Uh, this is surely overkill. I appreciate that important appeals should be heard by a bench consisting of three or more appeal sheriffs. But minor procedural matters hardly warrant such an army of judges. The Lord President gave an example of such a minor procedural matter when he gave evidence saying, and I quote, a common situation is an appeal where a decree has been taken in absence because through some blunder the defenders did not enter appearance on time, close quote. A single appeal sheriff would be perfectly capable of dealing with such an appeal. Furthermore, as there are only six sheriffs principal, at most only six sheriff appeal courts will be able to run at the same time. 
there would therefore be problems in running the Sheriff Appeal Court that would be caused by Lane Murray's amendments. Currently, Scotland's six sheriffs' principal deal with some civil appeals from their own sheriffdom. However, the new Sheriff Appeal Court will, in addition to those appeals, deal with all the civil appeals which currently go direct to the Court of Session. Further, the new court will require to deal with all summary criminal appeals which currently go direct to the High Court, meaning that all appeals which come from the Justice of the Peace Court and all summary criminal appeals which come from the Sheriff Court will require to be dealt with. It is important to note that the Sheriff Appeal Court will have to prioritise summary criminal work, restricting the court to a maximum of six sittings at any one time that could lead to delays in the delivery of civil appeals. And what if there's no specialist judge in the type of appeal? Elaine Murray's amendment would mean that the Sheriff Appeal Court could not be constituted and the appeal could not be heard. Instead of tying the court's hand in this way, it is vital instead that the court be empowered with the flexibility to adapt the size and constitution of its bench as appropriate to deal with a variety of types of cases which will come before it. Moving to Amendment 30, this has the effect that if the bench of the Sheriff Appeal Court consists of an even number of appeal sheriffs and they're equally divided in their verdict in any matter of fact or law, they cannot appoint the appeal to be reheard at another sitting of the court with a larger bench uh, comprising an odd number of appeal sheriffs. I presume that this amendment is to be read with Amendment 29. But as Amendment 29 states that there must not be fewer than three appeal sheriffs, that allows for four or six appeal sheriffs and the possibility of an evenly split decision, the result being that there would be nowhere for such a case to go for disposal. Amendment 34 would repeal the section of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995, which governs the quorum in some of the criminal appeals. At present, this provides for three appeal sheriffs for appeals against conviction and two for appeals against sentence only. Taken together with Elaine Murray's Amendment 29, the effect would be that the quorum for summary criminal appeals would be three in all cases, of whom one would have to be a sheriff principal and one would have to be a specialist in criminal law. This would increase the judicial resource required to consider summary appeals against sentence beyond the status quo, and in tandem with the limit in the number of sheriff's principal in the system, could lead to case backlogs. Amendments 5, 9, 10, 11, 12, 15, 16, 17, 18 in my name are a group of drafting amendments. The policy intention is that the court will sometimes be constituted of a panel of appeal sheriffs for important cases, but may comprise a single appeal sheriff for appeals on minor procedural matters. Lord Gill stated in his evidence to this committee on 22nd April that, and I quote, in appellate work in the Sheriff Court, the great bulk of the appeals are not appeals on the merits of the case at all, but procedural appeals against the refusal by a sheriff to allow a party to amend a case. I close quotes. We envisage that the vast majority of such cases would be heard by a single appeal sheriff. However, the bill deliberately leaves such decisions on quorum and who will preside at sittings of the court to rules of court. We've taken the view that any attempt in primary legislation to go further and micromanage the size of the bench or manage who's to preside in every circumstance would be impractical. That's why we've provided clear and unambiguous powers for the Court of Session to do so, instead through flexible rules of court proposed by the Scottish Civil Justice Council. In addition, we've empowered the Sheriff Appeal Court to react in real time to a live case and convene a larger bench under Section 56. Further, it will be for the President of the Sheriff Appeal Court to decide which of the appeal sheriffs are on the bench in any specific appeal. It is an important principle of Lord Gill's review, and therefore throughout the Bill, that courts have the flexibility to allocate the right judicial resources to the right courts. I would urge you, therefore, not to accept the Lane Murray's amendments in this case, which could have the effect of constraining the new court into an inflexible and administratively burdensome set of procedural obligations with regard to the size of bench and its constitution, stifling its ability to adapt to the circumstances before it. Turning to my amendments, the wording in the bill as introduced required to be clarified to be consistent with the fact that the Sheriff Appeal Court may if rules so provide, be constituted by a single appeal sheriff in some cases. This set of drafting amendments make it clear that the court can be constituted by a single appeal sheriff. And I move Amendment 5 in my name. Thank you very much. Elaine, uh, please uh, to speak to <coughs> Amendment 29 uh, and other amendments. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. The, um, these amendments really are, are probing amendments at the moment to try to, to, try to address the concerns that the, the committee uh, voiced about. 
the fact that appeals against judgments of the sheriff court might be heard by an appeal consisting of only one sheriff, uh, and the judgment of that sheriff would be binding on the appeal would be binding right across Scotland. And I think that the me committee members had had concerns about that. And the purpose of Amendment 29, uh, and it may not be worded absolutely correctly, would be to require an appeal to be heard, heard by three sheriffs, one of which would have to be a sheriff principal, and where relevant, one one must have a specialism appropriate to the matter of the appeal and the Lord President would decide whether uh, that was required. The current process of appeal to the Sheriff Principal can be considered to be anomalous as it replaces one judge's decision with another judge's decision. This would be compounded if, as suggested in the policy memorandum, the vast majority of appeals are to be decided by a single sheriff in the appeal court and that the appeal sheriff would not actually have to be a Sheriff Principal. There is also a risk in the bill as it stands that a judgment could be made by a specialist sheriff but the, the appeal heard by a sheriff with less expertise in that area. Even if the appeal were to be heard by a sheriff principal, the sheriff principal could have less experience than the original specialist sheriff. Uh, and that is why I included the provision where relevant that a sheriff uh, of the necessary specialism should be part of the appeal court. The jurisdiction of the sheriff appeal court could, will be more significant than the current appellate juris jurisdiction of the sheriff principal. As the exclusive competence of the court is being increased, litigants will no longer be able to appear directly to appeal directly to the uh, inner house of the court of session, uh, and decisions are binding on sheriffs throughout Scotland. The sheriff appeal court will also take over the current jurisdiction of the court of criminal appeal and summary criminal appeal cases. The provision of section 107 also severely limits the opportunity for further appeals to the inner house, and in most ca cases, the decisions of the sheriff appeal court will be final. My Amendment 29 introduces safeguards that the Appeal Court will consist of three sheriffs, and that was the intention anyway, uh, and that amongst them they will have sufficient experience and specialism to ensure that appeal judgments are consistent. Amendment 30 was consequential to Amendment 39. If, if the Sheriff Appeal Court consists of three sheriffs, there is no possibility of the court being equally divided, and the Bill does not need to make provision for this eventuality with regard to further appeal, and the amendment would re remove that clause. Amendment 34 is also consequential, as set Schedule 2 makes uh, changes to Section 173 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995. This section, as amended, shows it applies to the Sheriff Appeal Courts and Appeal Sheriffs instead of the High Court judges, court and judges. The Bill does not alter the uh, position with regard to criminal appeals. Amendment 29, however, sets a quorum at three for both civil and criminal cases, and if passed, who proceeds the need to amend the 1995 Act, and that section could simply be repealed. Section 97 gives the Court of Session the power to make various provisions by Act of Sedent, including the quorum for sittings of the Sheriff Appeal Court. However, that is beyond today's finishing point, uh, and a further amendment could be brought next week to make, uh, make alterations to Section 97 2 P. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members? Yeah. Margaret. I have some sympathy with um, Eileen Murray's um, amendment in that it tries to improve the provision in the, the bill and um, looks at the, the issue of just a single um, sheriff hearing another sheriff's appeal. However, um, I think it would require, well, it would require a panel to be heard by three uh, judges and that would, not in my opinion, be necessary in every case. Um, but we have the same concerns about the provision of the Bill and I hope when it comes to the amendments, my name, she will be sympathetic to them. Um, I was just to add also, I just want uh, clarity from uh, the Cabinet Secretary about, I think it was a, a very helpful explanation of why we don't want to um, have always three Sheriff Principals sitting or indeed a Sheriff Principal and two other Sheriffs sitting. But you, you, you made the point, I think, Cabinet Secretary, that the size of the appeal court, well, I think it was in rules of court, and on what, who would comprise the appeal court, we have a matter for the President, I think, of the Sheriff Appeal Court. I may have got that wrong. Who or who would that be? The president of the Sheriff Appeal Court would be the person that would ultimately decide. The rules of court who, will clearly be. Who would that be? Would that be the Sorry? Lord? Would that be Lord Gill? Who who would make that decision? Ultimately, the court of session. So it would be. Well, the the president is one of the appeal sheriffs, so it would be. It, it, it would be ultimately, all these things will ultimately fall within the domain of the Lord President. Uh, he will have the ability to. Uh, the, the, president, the President of the Appeal Court will be a Sheriff Principal. So, a Sheriff Principal 
will decide the com composition of an, a sheriff appellate court. Well, if they, whether if they it's a single sheriff on a minor amendment or whether we need something with more uh, two, three sh sheriff principles because it's a major matter. So it's just, I'm just trying to understand. I like the idea of the flexibility, but I just want to know how, how it works. The rules of court will be designed by the Lord President since he presides over that. The presiding of who, who actually constitutes uh, the bench will be for the President of the Sheriff Appeal Court, who will be a Sheriff Principal. Right, well, I, I've got that, but I don't know if that's it. So anyway, <laughs> I, move, I, move, <laughs> I move on. I appreciate it was a probing <laughs> amendment. I think it was very important. So can I ask you... Um, uh, Cabinet Secretary to wind up, please. Well, I think what we've already said is that the vast majority of appeals are minor and procedural, and it would be a huge waste of resources to have three sheriffs there. We do understand the point that uh, Elaine Murray is making, and that's why Section 56 allows the court to convene a larger bench if and when needed, and it's, I think, clearly a case where uh, the presiding uh, sheriff uh, principal will seek to get the appropriate expertise, but I think is the point I've been made certainly by yourself, we have the uh, ability to convene a larger bench for the complex cases, but I do believe that it would also be best for the bench himself to decide which would be the appropriate specialists to sit on it, given the particular case. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the question is, Amendment 5, be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. <laughs> <laughs> Those against, please show. Uh, abstentions? Six for, two against, one abstention. That amendment is agreed. The question is that section 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that section 47 and 48 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call amendment 26 in the name of Margaret Mitchell. Group of amendments 27 and 28. Margaret, please, to move amendment 26 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Amendments 26, 27 and 28 provide for all appeals in the Sheriff Appeal Court being heard by Sheriff's Principal instead of Sheriff's. The Gill Review recommended that appeals generally be heard by three judges chaired by the Sheriff Principal of that Sheriffdom. It recommended only appeals from cases heard under the simplified procedure should normally be heard by a single sheriff. The effect of my amendment would be that this single sheriff would be a sheriff principal um, level of um, judiciary. This is because appeals under the reforms affect not only the sheriffdom in which they are heard, but the law uh, Scotland-wide. Furthermore, it addresses the following concerns from the, the Gill Review, namely that it would be inappropriate for an appellate court to consist of members of the same level of judicial hierarchy as those from whom an appeal is marked. As a consequence of the amendments, as the Gill Review noted, a Sheriff Appeal Court would require an increase in the number of Sheriff principles and this could be done by appointing a number of judicial officers of equivalent rank to a sheriff principal to sit as members of the court with the status and powers of a sheriff principal but without the specific responsibility for the administration of business that the current sheriff's principal have. Amendment 26 removes the provision allowing sheriffs to be appointed as appeal sheriffs and amendments 27 and 20 are consequential to this amendment. I move amendment 26. Any other member wish to speak? Elaine Murray? Yeah, I, I think Margaret Mitchell is, is addressing some of the same <clears throat> issues as I was trying to address with, with my, my amendments. The only problem I have with Margaret's uh, um, amendments is that they would remove the possibility of a specialist sheriff being appointed as an appeal sheriff. And I think there could be cases where actually having a specialist sheriff as an appeal sheriff could be very important, particularly if it was against a decision of another a specialist sheriff. So for that reason, I wouldn't be able to support the amendment, is it? As it sounds. No other members have indicated. Cabinet Secretary. 
Yeah, well, thank you, Kavir. In the debate in the previous group of amendments, members stressed the importance of having a Sheriff Appeal Court constituted by three experienced judges, and I argued that it was important that there should be flexibility to set the quorum of the court to reflect the nature of the appeal, and it would be disproportionate to require minor procedural appeals which raise no general points of law to be decided by a three-judge court, but serious and difficult appeals should continue to be heard by a bench of three, and the Sheriff Appeal Court will sometimes have to overrule itself, which could only be done by a larger court. So the court will often have to sit with three judges, and sometimes even with five or more. Uh, section 49 allows a Lord President to appoint sheriffs of at least five years standing as appeal sheriffs. Those appointed as appeal sheriffs would be experienced judges, perfectly capable of handling appeals in the sheriff appeal courts. And I think that is sensible and will result in a suitable pool of appeal sheriffs available to the President of the Sheriff Appeal Court for the efficient disposal of business. The effect of these amendments, omitting Section 49, would be that the only judges who could become appeal sheriffs would be sheriff's principal. Uh, there are six sheriffdoms, there are six sheriff's principal. If these amendments were carried out, there would only be six appeal sheriffs. The bill proposes that the sheriff appeal court should hear not only civil appeals from the sheriff court, but also summary criminal appeals. And appeals against conviction require three judge appeal courts, so to do civil appeals raising difficult or important issues of law. If these amendments were carried, either type of case would involve half the available judges. There is no simple way that this system could operate with only six judges, and as I argued in relation to the previous grouping of amendments, it would be wrong to treat sheriff's principal differently from other appeal sheriffs, all of whom will be highly qualified and experienced judges, and has, as Elaine Murray had alluded to, uh, those with the appropriate expertise, and consequently I pose amendments 26, 27 and 28 in the name of Margaret Mitchell. Margaret, to wind up. Uh, I regret that the, the Cabinet Secretary didn't listen to what I said in my opening uh, statement, which made quite clear that um, there would be more share of principles um, appointed and they wouldn't necessarily have to have this uh, specific responsibility of administration of business that the current sheriff principal have in the six sheriffdoms. So it wouldn't be restricted to merely six sheriff's principal. Uh, in in terms of the specialised nature of, of some of the sheriffs being included in the appeal, then um, I, I think that could be uh, quite clearly up to the sheriff principal in the appeal court to look at the other sheriff principal specialisation and include them within uh, a certain appeal. But instead, what the Scottish Government is proposing is, is that appeals would generally be heard by a single sheriff albeit maybe, as the, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, with five years standing, although the bill doesn't leave it open for appeals to be heard by Sheriff Principal um, or larger benches. The financial memorandum assumes 95% of appeals will be heard by only one judge. Uh, now, the Cabinet Secretary has said in previous comments that he feels a, a, a lot of these cases will be procedural, but at the same time he says that he can't micromanage various appeals. So clearly we, we don't know what these 95% of appeals uh, really would consist of. And I repeat, I'm particularly concerned that the bill's approach would result in the situation that appeals from decisions by a sheriff would be heard by a single judge of the same seniority. And the conclusion of the Gill Review was that it would be inappropriate for the appellate court to consist of members of the same level of the judicial hierarchy as those um, from whom an appeal is, is marked. And again, I make the point, we're not just talking about decisions affecting one sheriffdom, it affects the whole of Scotland. Uh, more worryingly still, the government appears to have taken the decision to depart from the Gill Review recommendations, not because it will improve the justice system, but because um, fina of financial considerations. And um, the financial memorandum certainly recognises that the makeup of the appeal court has financial implications. Now, while there are justifiable um, costs to be saved here, it cannot be at the expense of access to justice or 
having the proper appeal heard by the proper panel of appeal court judges. The Scottish Government response to the Justice Committee Stage 1 report stated that if appeals had to be heard by a share of principal, then this would negate some of the advantages to be derived from the establishment of the Sheriff Appeal Court as, for instance, there may not be an appeal sheriff who is a sheriff principal available to hear the appeal. This response does not reject the advantages of having sheriff principals sitting in the appeal court. It merely points out that the changes and the rules require additional resources. So if the committee supports amendments, um, then at stage three, I would intend to revisit whether further amendments would be necessary to remit, to permit the appointment of additional sheriff principals as recommended in the Gill review. Are you what? pressing or withdrawing? Press, press amendment. The question is amendment 26. 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Those, there's a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. There are no abstentions. Two in favour, seven against. That amendment is not agreed. I now move to amendment 27 in the name of Margaret Mitchell. Ready to debate amendment 26. Margaret, to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Question, oops. Call amendment 28 in the name of Margaret Mitchell. Ready to debate amendment 26. Margaret, to move or not move? Not move. Call Amendment 6 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary in a group on its own. Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to this amendment. Please. Uh, se section 50 of the Bill permits the re-employment of appeal sheriffs who have ceased to hold that office but have yet to reach the age of 75. Appeal sheriffs who are sheriff's principal and sheriffs will not be paid additional remuneration for acting as such, though they may be paid expenses, uh, since such deployment is and will be considered development opportunity. This is in accordance with normal practice in this area. For example, sheriffs who act up as temporary court of session judges are not paid extra. Amendment 6 will, however, permit the payment of remuneration to former appeals sheriffs who are re-employed under Section 50 of the Bill. It is expected that former appeals sheriffs will normally be retired and therefore in such an instance payment for their time is appropriate. The Lord President may consider that such re-employment is necessary in order to facilitate the disposal of business in the Sheriff Appeal Court. This will mean that re-employed appeal sheriffs are remunerated in the same way that re-employed sheriffs and summary sheriffs are paid by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service under Section 16 of the Bill. And I move Amendment 6. I wish to. No. Elaine, I beg your pardon. Just a, a, a brief question. I was wondered. I presume that uh, they, uh, the appeal shares have, uh, have been, former appeal shares have been omitted from section, should have been in section 16 and have been omitted in error. I just wondered why we were not amending section 16 rather than this section here. Parts on the Sheriff Appeal Court together in the bill. That's the technical reason, so it's all part of that appropriate section, so it's easier to discover it. One hopes. I love the way that was passed along. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least it wasn't Chinese whispers. We ended up with the right, I presume, the right piece. Uh, I take it, Cabinet Secretary, don't wish to wind up. Well, thanks. Uh, questions, Amendment 6, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Questions, that Section 50, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Great. Section 51, be agreed to. That's the question. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, call Amendment 7 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, Group with Amendment 8. Cabinet Secretary, move Amendment 7 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Thank you. This group of amendments is intended to assist with the successful establishment of the Sheriff Appeal Court. Amendment 7 is required to introduce Amendment 8, which will permit Senators of the College of Justice, as Court of Session and High Court judges are formally known, to be appointed to act as Appeal Sheriffs in the new Sheriff Appeal Court by the Lord President in order to assist the Appeal Sheriffs, both Sheriffs and Sheriff Principal, with the appellate work in that court. This arrangement would, however, be restricted to a period of three years to permit the Senators to pass on the benefit of their practical and legal expertise in dealing with appellate work. Senators are to act as, but not be, Appeal Sheriffs. However, they are to be treated as Appeal Sheriffs. Accordingly, just as in the same way as Sheriff's Principal are not given greater powers in the Sheriff Appeal Court uh, than Sheriffs who are also Sheriffs, the same is to apply for Senators. I'm aware that concerns have been expressed by the Committee about Appeal Sheriffs who are not Sheriff's Principal hearing appeals while sitting alone. I believe that the assistance of Senators in the early years of the Sheriff Appeal Court will allow Appeal Sheriffs, both Sheriffs and Sheriff's Principal, to build up the expertise of that court in handling and deciding upon appeals. 
Most of the business of the Sheriff Appeal Court will be minor and procedural, and the Government is therefore confident that appeal sheriffs sitting alone will be perfectly capable of dealing with such appeals, particularly after they've had the benefit of the assistance and expertise of senators sitting beside them as appeal sheriffs in the early days. Under the provisions of the Bill, it will be for the Court rules made by the Lord President to decide upon the quorum of the Court in particular kinds of cases. It would be wrong for the Bill to restrict this flexibility. The Lord President will be able to appoint as many senators to act as appeal sheriffs as the Lord President considers necessary for the purposes of the Court during the three-year transitional period. A senator will only be appointed to act as an appeal sheriff if they have held office as a senator for at least one year. The appointment of a senator will not affect the senator's capacity as a court of session judge or as a high court judge, and they may continue to act in those capacities. The provisions permitting certain senators to act as appeal sheriffs are to be active for a transitory period of three years after the sheriff appeal court becomes operational. After that period, all the appointments of senators under this temporary provision will cease. A senator who acts as an appeal sheriff will, however, be able to continue to give judgment or deal with a matter relating to a case they're involved in, with which began before the expiry of that period. To make it permanently possible for the Lord President to appoint senators to act as appeal sheriffs would go against both the rationale for having a sheriff appeal court and the principle of the bill generally, which is to ensure that cases are dealt with at the lowest level in the court structure at which they can competently be dealt with. The sheriff appeal court will deal with summary criminal appeals and most of the civil appeals before it will be procedural in nature, neither of which merit the attention of the High Court or the inner house of the Court of Session. But it is right that in its early years, the new court should benefit from the assistance and experience of senators of the Court of Session. And I move Amendment 7. I, mean, I, I welcome the fact that the traditional arrangements are being brought in, and I think it's a, a sensible thing to do. My question really is that given that these reforms are expected to take over a period of 10 years before the summary sheriffs are all in place and so on, how the period of three years for the transition, transitional period was arrived at, why three years is appropriate rather than a, perhaps a longer period. Roderick? Yeah, no, I just wanted to comment that I do believe this is a, a sensible move to take advantage of the judicial experience of the senators, uh, and I think it will assist. I'm sure that, kind of, as to the question whether it's three years or, or longer, I, think I shouldn't have thought it's anything more than a considered view as to how long it was necessary to get the uh, Sheriff Appeal Court up and running. Um, so I don't have a problem with the three-year period. Margaret. Yeah, well, well, the experience of the judicial sen senators is, of course, where welcome. It's a temporary measure, and in my view, it merely muddies the waters and makes the, the bill quite unclear in, in what it's doing and trying to achieve. Right. Uh, Cabinet Secretary muddies the waters. No, I don't believe so. I think there's two separate uh, parts of the bill. Some of these sheriffs are distinct and separate and they won't be sitting in the Sheriff Appeal Court. Uh, the period of three years was the suggestion of the Lord President and I think it's a proportionate measure to ensure that when we do uh, establish uh, this court that we have the appropriate experience uh, that can be shared. Uh, clearly, uh, as we've already indicated in earlier discussions and earlier uh, uh, amendments, the vast majority of appeals are minor procedural, would be relatively straightforward and they won't require that assistance. Uh, but for that transitory period, then I do think it's appropriate that if the uh, Lord President feels it appropriate, that there should be an experienced senator who can give their uh, counsel and wisdom to ensure that in the complex cases that will require uh, to uh, be presided over by more than uh, one uh, member of the judiciary, uh, that they have that experience there. But uh, it was a timescale chosen by him, and we are happy to accept that as a government. Questions, amendments, thank you. Questions, amendments, seven, we agreed to, are we all agreed? No. Uh, there's a division, those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. I glo you glory sometimes, Margaret, being the only one, I know. Uh, for eight, against one, no abstentions, that amendment is agreed to. Call amendment eight in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, ready to wait amendment seven, Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Questions, amendment eight be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. There's a division, there's a disagreement. Those for that the amendment eight please show. Those against, please show. You go for it, Margaret. Uh, <laughs> for eight, one against, no abstentions. That amendment is agreed to. The questions at sections 52 to 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. 
Call Amendment 29, the name of Elaine Murray. Already debated with Amendment 5. Elaine, to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that Section 55 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 9, the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 5. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. No. <laughs> <laughs> Those in favour, please show if you... If you did you have your hand up? It's yes. up. It's up. Those against, please show. Six, four, three against, no abstentions. That amendment is agreed. Call Amendment 10 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Ready to Amendment 5. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Six in favour, three against. No abstentions. That amendment is agreed to. Call Amendment 13 in the name of Elaine Murray. Ready to debate Amendment 6. Moved. I get to say something. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> if the Amendment 30 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 11 preemption. Okay. No, you're queued. Anyway. It's not moved. <laughs> no. I call Amendment 11. I'm busy scribbling things out. It's all right, Mother. Call Amendment 11 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Ready to be debated with Amendment 5. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Move. Questions Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. The four, six against three, no abstentions. That amendment is agreed. Call Amendment 12 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Led to be with Amendment 5. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Move. The question is Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There's a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. There are no abstentions. Six, four, three against. That amendment is agreed to. Question is that section 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. agreed. Question is that sections 57 to 59 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. 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 Call Amendment 13, name of the Cabinet Secretary Group with Amendment 14. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 13 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Thank you. This group of amendments is intended to provide for the records of the Sheriff Appeal Court to be produced and kept in electronic form. Amendment 13 will permit the Sheriff Appeal Court to keep records electronically and be able to authenticate a record or a copy of a record by means of an electronic signature. Amendment 14 defines what is meant by an electronic signature. Given that one of the key aims of the Bill is to modernise the justice system, bring it into the 21st century, it is appropriate to make provision ensuring that the Sheriff Appeal Court may from the outset keep and authenticate its records electronically. Provision already exists elsewhere for electronic signatures to be used. For example, the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 permits electronic signatures on specific documents relating to summary criminal proceedings. The Scottish Government Digital Strategy is investigating with the Scottish Court Service the possibility of greater use of electronic signatures in the context of court proceedings, for example, warrants and interim orders. If these advances are to happen in the Sheriff Courts, we agree that they should also happen in the Sheriff Appeal Court, as that court will receive appeals from the Sheriff Court. The existing provisions in Section 60 allow records of the Sheriff Appeal Court to be authenticated by being signed by an appeal sheriff or a clerk of the court. A record means an interlocutor, decree, minute or other documents relating to the proceedings and decisions of the Sheriff Appeal Court. A clerk of the court may also authenticate a copy of such a record as a true copy. Amendment 13 will make clear that such records can be produced in electronic format and that such records or copies of them can be authenticated electronically. In the case of records by an appeal sheriff or a clerk of the court, in the case of a copy by the clerk of the court. Amendment 14 defines the meaning to be given to electronic signatures by reference to the meaning given to that phrase in the Electronic Communications Act 2000 and includes in that definition a printed version of that electronic signature. Further, in conjunction with Amendment 13, the Court may specify another form of authentication by act of sederant made by the Court of Session, full, uh, allowing the Court to adjust it to meet practice or procedural requirements. Ongoing developments in ICT, which we cannot perhaps envisage or contemplate now, may mean that some other definition of electronic authentication should be added in the future, and the Court should be able to use their powers to flexibly adjust for any such development. It is essential that our courts are enabled to use technology to help them appropriately process the business. I move Amendment 13. 
No one has indicated. I don't think that's controversial for us. We're quite technological <laughs> on here these days. Um, and I take a Captain second you don't want to wind up. The well, question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 14 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated Amendment 13. Cabinet Secretary to move Boom. formally. Questions Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Questions at Section 6 to be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And that ends consideration of amendments for today. I thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials. And we now move into private session. Wait for the room to clear, please.